joining us today. Hey, um, John, it's, it's still setting up here, sorry. Okay, all right. Yeah, I had to kind of scramble to this sort of a setting too. It was left my earbuds at home, so I'm- All right, go ahead. Okay, we're ready now, here we go. Hey, listen everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, this is the second in a series of talks that I'm having with various uh, um, individuals. You know, uh, three weeks ago, we had uh, Harvard professor Arthur Brooks uh, join me for a talk. And tonight uh, we have the mayor of Sioux Falls, Paul Tenhaken. Uh, welcome, glad you could join us. Hey, thanks, Don. Glad to be here, man. Yeah. And so just for the audience sake, uh, uh, you know, just want to make sure everybody knows uh, that uh, you know, Mayor Paul is the mayor of uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, you know, for those of you that are listening in Kansas and Arlington and uh, parts uh, remote, uh, and uh, you know, Paul, had, Paul and his wife Jill have uh, lived here for several years since college, really. And 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 uh, twenty know, years, man. Has it been twenty years? Time flies. Yeah. Well. Started a business called Click Rain, which is kind of a, uh, a marketing technology firm and uh, was a, a successful business. Uh, you know, one of the fastest growing businesses in, in South Dakota and, and in fact in the nation, I think. And of course, that's the way we do things here in South Dakota. You know, we, um, you know, we have the kind of, uh, you know, business environment that, that allows that to happen. And, and we attract the kind of talent that uh, makes that sort of thing happen. Uh, so uh, excited to have you here, uh, and uh, you know I, you know, you know it was interesting as I was kind of reviewing your bio, and I don't think I knew that you had a a, a C three nonprofit to promote uh, uh, international travel for business leaders, uh, the Dispatch Project, and and uh, so that's very cool. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I appreciate your, you know, your your passion uh, in that regard, and. And uh, in 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 leadership and and in people development, I you know that's a big deal. You know this isn't always just about the government institution the way we do things here. You know we look at also business leaders, uh, the business institution and the education institution and and uh, the, and the community. I mean all those work together to make a you know an environment that uh, a society that really encourages liberty and. And opportunity, and so I, I appreciate your your diversity of interest in that regard. So, so tonight, uh, what uh, what Mayor Paul and I are going to talk about is, uh, you know, I I want to of course get an update on on the COVID nineteen situation and and um, and kind of I think a transition. I think we're at a transition, uh, uh, and and so we want to talk about what. The next steps are going to look like what the what our society is going to look like, or our our, our community is going to look like, and and um, you know how do we gradually get past you know, some of the challenges we've had here in the past uh, you know past couple of months, and then we're going to devote some time to talking about um, public discourse and and being civil and and uh, you know how we advance society. Uh, you know, in in a fashion where we can all be proud of ourselves, honestly, uh, or or not not be unkind. I'll put it that way. So, uh, so first of all, Paul, why don't you tell us uh, and forgive me for the uh, familiarity there, Mayor. Uh, talk about where we're at today with uh, COVID nineteen in in Sioux Falls. You know, and and I mean, let's. Let's just kind of cover some of the positives, uh, you know, the, the positive uh, tests and uh, hospitalization, how many have recovered and what the trend lines look like. I mean, I'm just going to give you some time just to kind of visit about where you think we're at today. What's the snapshot? Sure. Well, first off, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me on here. And to your point, you can absolutely call me Paul. Uh, you know, uh, we're, you know, I'm going to call you Don. You're not Mr. Hager to me tonight, too. You're Don. So, um, so yeah, as, as you mentioned, kind of your setup, been the mayor for two years now. And uh, in that first two years time, we've had, uh, we've had some interesting challenges in the city. We had a 
some spring flooding, some fall flooding. We had uh, some tornadoes a little under a year ago in our city. Uh, now we're dealing with this pandemic. And in South Dakota, where we sit in this pandemic, is um, about 90%, a little less now probably, of the cases, total coronavirus cases in South Dakota have been in the Sioux Falls MSA. And um, that has created a lot of challenges because it's very hard to uh, know from a statewide response, how do you respond to coronavirus when you've got this huge pain point in Sioux Falls and some of the rest of the state seeing nothing. And I think that's, that's made it hard for our governor to make decisions on that. It's made it hard for me to know how we should react uh, on that. Where we sit today is we've been seeing a gradual downward trend in the number of cases in our community. But more importantly than that is, um, you know, when this thing was really heating up and we had a tremendous outbreak at, at the Smithfield Port plant in Sioux Falls and, and we were on kind of rocket ship growth in the terms of the number of our cases, we were really anticipating 20 to 25 percent hospitalization rates and we were preparing for up to six, seven hundred beds potentially maybe need to be dedicated for COVID patients. Well, where we sit today, the most we've ever had as inpatients in one time and our two large healthcare systems in Sioux Falls has been 71. Uh, we're at about 50 patients today. And so there has just been, um, and it's good, grossly missed projections on the federal level, on the state level, on the local level, um, which again is good news. And so where we sit today is we've seen hospitalization rate right around 5%, 6%. You know, we're seeing one tenth of our hospital beds used. Uh, today, we had 17 new cases in Minnehaha County. Um, very low growth. And now, some will say, "Well, how many are you testing?" Okay, if you're only testing 18, well, then 17 is not good. And that's the national dialogue. You know, we need more tests, and we continue to need more testing. Uh, testing is still the number one issue I think that cities and states are facing with uh, assuring their residents that the coronavirus is under control. But where, where, where I think we're at today in Sioux Falls, kind of answer your question is, um, quite honestly, the last couple of weeks have been a, a couple of weeks of impatience, right? People are, people are done, they're over it. And, and we really haven't even done near the regulations and kind of the, the government mandates that you've seen around the country. Okay. And I don't, I don't know how some of these states are, are doing this because here in Sioux Falls, I see the restlessness that's occurring of people just saying, let's just be done. I mean, I'm sick of the masks. I'm sick of the ordinances. I'm sick of executive orders. People just got to get it and we got to move on. And while there may be a little bit of truth to that, we're still proceeding in kind of this cautious next phase of of and I want to say reopening because you know, like the governor has said often too in, in South Dakota, we've never closed, but there is a desire to start. All right, let's learn, start loosening it up. Let's start building up some consumer confidence again, so that people get out. They start living their lives in a cautious way, and we have to realize we got this new friend we're living with for a while. His name is coronavirus, and we got to figure out how to coexist with this thing for a while. Right, you know and. And one thing that people should know uh, and, and should be proud of, frankly, is that we were extremely well prepared uh, here in South Dakota. We had more beds per capita than any other state in the, in the union. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and, and the, the leadership of, of each of the majors, major uh, you know, health uh, systems here in Sioux Falls had already had their contingency plans ready uh, if they needed those additional beds or additional beds beyond, uh, you know, the beds that they already had, the existing beds. And so, uh, you know, uh, once again, I think, uh, you know, our citizens can be, can be proud of that. Um, additionally, uh, you know, I, I think we, we should be proud of our, uh, our reaction, both from uh, a public official perspective, as well as a citizenry perspective. Uh, perspective, there wasn't a, an overreaction uh, on the part of uh, our government entities. Uh, for crying out loud, I, uh, in, in Pennsylvania, uh, the, the, Pencil, uh, the Pennsylvania governor called out the quarterback of the Pittsburgh Steelers for, for getting a haircut uh, because he, uh, the, the governor had said, oh, we're shutting everything down. 
And, uh, and so there were some civil liberties violations in, in a number of other states and, and in municipalities. And, you know, we, we certainly didn't uh, overreact and go that far. So I'm, I'm grateful for the, the common sense judgment and leadership that we've had from, uh, from the governor and, uh, and legislators and, and uh, uh, our municipalities. Are, you know, well, and, and quite honestly, you know, oops, sorry about that. Quite honestly, we were close. We were close to looking at a stay-at-home order for two weeks. I wanted. I was looking at a stay-at-home order for two weeks, and that was right on the, you know, the spike trajectory of the Smithfield case. We were doubling our case counts every three days, and saying, okay, we got to get a handle on this pretty quick because if this doesn't flatten off soon, we are going to be challenged with our healthcare capacity. And what people have forgotten in the response to this, Don, is the goal from the get-go has been to flatten the curve, okay? So slow down the spread. It's not to stop the spread. And as harsh as it sounds, it's not to prevent deaths from COVID because some of those are going to happen. And, yeah. and that's not to sound callous, but the deaths, though, that would occur from people not being able to get the care they needed that would absolutely be on my shoulders. If we did not slow this down enough that our healthcare capacity was overwhelmed, then we screwed up. But right now with 90% of the beds available that we, you know, uh, that we plan for, there's plenty of capacity. So people will say, well, you open up too quick, you're gonna kill people. And you're gonna, you know, those deaths are gonna be on, on, on you, Paul. And people will say that to me. I say, listen, as long as they got the ability to get care, that's the main goal that we've been focused on all along and the goalposts have not moved. That's still the goal. And, and the, then the other piece that, you know, that I wanted to visit about uh, or make sure that we emphasize tonight and, and you've talked about it and the governor's talked about it is personal responsibility on behalf of private citizens. Uh, you know, be smart about your interactions. Uh, know what the what the COVID nineteen uh, you know uh, what the CDC is saying you know washing hands and and wearing masks where appropriate and if you're high risk you know be smart about that don't expose yourself to to uh, you know to uh, unnecessary risk as you know like I said if you're high risk uh, especially so uh, and and I think our citizenry for the most part has done that I mean and. You know, I and I get the challenges we had with Smithfield because of all the uh, the new Americans there and the the, the language challenges. But um, uh, you know, I I feel pretty good about you know how how we've handled all that. So let's let's move. And the trend line is good too. It's it's heading down, like you mentioned, and and so I. You know, I think we can we can proceed a little bit, but we do have to be cautious and be smart about it. Too. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about uh, what impact the last couple of months has had on availability of of municipal services. You know, as you and I are very much aware, uh, our municipality is largely sales tax revenue uh, dependent now. The, uh, the March revenue actually wasn't all that bad, uh, but we're waiting to see what the April numbers are. And we expect probably a 20, 25% decrease in that. Um, wh what do you, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, do you anticipate some cuts or are you kind of working through some possibilities? Mm -hmm. What impact is that going to have on, on, on government services? Yeah. So, so we have our April sales tax numbers. Um, our audited sales tax numbers and the decrease year over year uh, we we've been averaging around six a little north of six percent growth this year we're at about a 2.6 percent uh, negative growth in April much more palatable than uh, I was anticipating still uh, significant when you've been kind of floating at six percent however I don't think April's the bad month I mean May and in June is when you kind of see some catch up numbers. And so we are planning for some significant cuts. I got a budget meeting tomorrow actually um, on this topic to talk about where those cuts are gonna have to occur. 
and we have not had to furlough any employees uh, and not have lay off any employees, but we've had to readjust how we're delivering services. For instance, our libraries have been closed, pick on libraries, they're, they're closed. We're still trying to deliver some of the services with curbside pickup and, and some of the digital delivery and so forth, um, but you can't go to a library. Some of our parks assets, most notably, um, our pools. We're not gonna be able to open our pools this year. And that's, that was a gut-wrenching decision to have to make for a ton of reasons. The biggest being, Pools are an equitable resource for people of all income levels in a community can utilize a pool. And there's certain people at certain income levels in a community where pools all they really have in the summer. And you take that away from them and you take a big piece out of their life. But given the economic challenges, the staffing challenges, the health and safety challenges, um, it just wasn't feasible. It takes us about four to five weeks to open our pools. So even if we said, hey, today we're going to open them, it's end of June before they're even open. And uh, it just wasn't realistic. So we're going to be looking at that um, as the sales tax numbers come in. And people are going to see a reduction in some some services in the city. I mean, that that's for sure. And that could mean instead of a mill and overlay of your road, which is scheduled for this year, you may limp along. We may have to do pothole repair another year on that road that was scheduled for repair. Uh, and maybe that new park asset, you know, may have to wait. And so the core essentials of government, though, you know, wastewater, your public safety, you know, and those sorts of things, those will not get cut. We will continue to add officers based on our population growth. And there's certain things you just don't sacrifice. But there's some of those quality of life things you have to say, do these have to wait a little bit based on the current landscape? Yeah, agreed. Uh, and and I do want you to know I, I'm doing my part to uh, to mitigate, you know, some of those decreases. I got a parking ticket this morning and paid it right away. Hey, great. So Go get one tomorrow too, would you? Uh, that's right. That, that could be a, a new campaign, right? Yeah. <laughs> Out your city. Go get a parking ticket. Right. <laughs> While you're doing business with a with a with one of our locally owned businesses with a local business go downtown park illegally do some business we all win there you, there you go so <laughs> um, so let's talk about business now you know obviously you know the the restaurant business sector and probably the hospitality sector those two in particular have been deeply impacted but but you just announced some uh, some major relaxation of of restrictions at the, you know at the end of the month, and so let's talk about that for the audience. Um, um, what was yeah? So we well the, the the thought the thought on this is that um, it, you know, and I know you'll appreciate the message that the free market just needs to run run itself and run its course, and right now. I'll give you a real example that uh, last night I'm driving to my city council meeting at 6.30. I drive down uh, Phillips Avenue, kind of the main stretch in downtown. Um, bars and restaurants can be open, stores can be open. Um, and there's not a lot of people downtown. And none of those places were at capacity, even close. Even though um, we have, well, we have some restrictions, they could have had a lot more people. So you get to the point where you say, why do we have a restriction in place that isn't, isn't um, hurting this? And there's no reason for us to even have a ceiling on it. Let's remove it and let's let the market slowly return to what they're comfortable with, personal responsibility. Some people will feel comfortable going out, some will not. So in my opinion, the less time we can have any sort of regulation on business, the better. I mean, th those regulations were put in for a period of time to help slow the curve. That's been done in Sioux Falls, as we talked about earlier with the numbers. So the sooner we can lift that off and be done and get out of this regulation world, this over-regulation world that we're kind of in, the better. Well, that's music to my ears uh, because I'm not a big fan of regulation. And, uh, and I agree completely. And I, I will tell you, I've, I've seen uh, a number of businesses uh, really be innovative in terms of delivering uh, products and services to uh, to their customers during this time. And so I think if you do let the government get out of the way and, and you get the regulations out of the way, uh, businesses figure out how to thrive or at least survive in, in these sorts of situations. And, and the better businesses have, I think have been doing that. Uh, I, I believe that. 
Uh, and it's interesting that, you know, mm -hmm. at, the, at a federal mm -hmm. level, and even to a degree at the state level, uh, as soon as the, uh, the pandemic started, what was the first reaction? It was to relax regulation uh, so that uh, people, uh, businesses uh, could be more nimble in responding, uh, especially around the healthcare functions. And, and I think there's lessons to be learned there uh, that often if you let the market uh, you run, it finds the equilibrium that makes more sense. And, uh, and, and so I, I, I think your point is well taken that, uh, I mean, and, it, and that still comes back to a, a personal responsibility or the business needs to be responsible in the way they're delivering. Uh, and, and they, I think um, many of them have responded. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a big deal. So uh, let's talk a little bit then about the fact that now we're probably um, one of the first metros in the country to, to be wide open here, uh, you know, at the end of the month. What's your reaction to that? It's about that, but you're also kind of um, honored. You know, you want to try and lead the way, but you don't want to uh, screw it up either. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. The, the PBR, the Professional Bull Riders Tour, is bringing an event to Sioux Falls in July. They're going to have uh, 3,500. Am I sideways now? Okay. There. Oh, I lost you. I, my, my connection went out there for a second. So I had to, uh, I had to redial in. How's that? Is that better? You're good. Okay. Uh, the, P, the PBR is coming to Sioux Falls and they're coming to Sioux Falls because, um, they know that this is a place that will welcome them and figure out how they can do business here and how they can hold their event here. They're going to have 3,500 people in a venue that seats uh, probably about 10, 11,000 for something like that. And they're going to use the test to see, okay, how do we do this in uh, in a market like Sioux Falls? Mm -hmm. And so we have uh, a lot of national events that are reaching out to Sioux Falls and reaching out to our CVB right now that say, Hey, North Carolina won't let us be here. Hey, uh, you know, Florida doesn't want us. Can we have a, this softball tournament in August in South Dakota? Can we have this track and field event in September? And so people are reaching out to us. And so that either makes us really smart or really dumb. And, and that's what we're trying to figure out is um, we, we want to have those events. I'll go, we want to. They, they, I'll go with the former. Well, yeah. I, I, and, I hope so. But, um, and, and, but and so that's thing, what we're nervous about that i'm nervous and i'm excited at the same time because there's uh there's just this unrest of you know all the talk about the second wave of this and all this the last thing you want to do is loosen things up and all of a sudden the second wave is worse than the first and you got to re-implement some of these measures that you never want to see again well I, you know and I, and I appreciate that and the thing what I what what I think is kind of cool about the idea of these folks reaching out to us, and I'm aware of that, is is often once they get here, they decide, hey, we want to keep coming back. Right. And so I, I think, uh, I, ironically, uh, this sort of situation could be uh, it could be kind of a silver lining in the cloud that we're we're dealing with. So uh, you know because. I mean, you you and I know once people get here, they're um, they're amazed and, and completely impressed by what we have to offer. Well, part of it, Don, is I think these these events and other things have seen how at least in Sioux Falls we have tried to be so nimble in how we're responding to this, and you know we we may talk about this later, but I've not been locked in any one position at any given time during this thing where it's like. We're going this way, the data shows us this, we pivot, now we're doing this, okay, now we're strict, now we're gonna reopen this. It's like, we're quick, we're responding. Versus like, a, a, you know, the, the Governor Whitmer in Michigan and places like that where they just continue to double down in their positions to the point where it doesn't even make any sense anymore to take some of those positions, but they're so married to that initial position that they don't wanna switch from it. And that makes no sense to me. And so, that's, that's just uh, baffling to me. And I think other people notice when a city like Sioux Falls says, all right, they got leadership that's willing to do what's right when the data says to do this. And when it doesn't, they're going to do this. And that is a 
perfect segue to my next question. Um, because you did something pretty remarkable for, for an elected official a few weeks ago, uh, openly admitting that you were wrong about projections and, and you, you, know, you, you hadn't agreed with the governor. And then when you, when you saw that the projections were different, you did agree with her. Very unusual, very refreshing. I don't, as a, as a recovering legislator, I don't remember you know, changing my, uh, you know, or admitting that I was wrong about very much. And, and so that was really actually very refreshing. Um, and, and so, you know, I was gonna say, well, walk me through that process, but uh, you really already have. Um, and, and I just wanna, you know, you know compliment you for, uh, you know, for being humble in that way. I, you know, that's a refreshing uh, and like I said, unusual uh, perspective from a, well, it's it's a bummer that that's refreshing, you know, to be honest with you, because it, it just is, um, I don't know, I, I found that I think people appreciate more when they realize you as an elected official, you don't have all the answers. And if you act like you do, um, it will come out pretty quick that you don't and people will sniff that out. And so you have to make the best decisions at any given time based on the information you have in front of you and information changes, facts change and data changes. And if you're not willing to shift your opinion and uh, your policy and your strategy be, for that, then you're probably not in the right chair because you're going to end up doing people a disservice. And, you know, the, I, again, I hate to keep picking on Michigan. My brother lives in Michigan and he, my brother is a borderline libertarian. And so he, he is sending me some scathing texts and, and the, talking about their their deficit that they're going to have on the state level and everything and it's like well a lot of these are self-inflicted wounds that that they're doing to themselves right now because the leadership will not adjust to the information that's being presented to them yeah no that's you know that's absolutely true and um um you know that you know and i've i've i remember seeing that in the legislature like i mentioned and and uh, but when you know when you when you can approach, when you hit, when you make uh, you know data-driven decisions, you know, and, and you make sure you look at all the information, and if you have a uh, an open mind about things, you're generally going to get better, better uh, you know results and better decisions. Um, mm -hmm. so that's that's the key here. Now, initially, um, you you, know, you expressed some frustration um, over the special session. And the legislature you know, didn't want to extend uh, your powers at that time, and uh, but it, I felt like you made a conscious decision to change your approach after that. Um, did you, or either way, give me your perspective on? on, on yeah, that. so you know, the, the most frustrating part of this entire pandemic response is that I, as a mayor, uh, am in charge of 80 square miles. 200,000 people and have tools to put laws in, in place and to do first readings, second readings, notice things. It, and it's a very unnimble process. So I'm trying to respond quickly and do things where I have to notice a meeting, first reading, five days later, second reading, then we got to post it and then it goes into effect. It can be two weeks. And in two weeks right now is, is like two years in COVID time. And so my frustration with the legislature was, was them saying, listen, we're not going to lead on the state level. We want you as municipalities to make the decisions that are best for your community. And, and, that, and my response was great. Then give me the tools that I need and the flexibility I need to do that. So that was where my frustration came from. And them saying, lead locally, but we're going to still kind of make you have one hand behind your back in the process. And uh, that's it's made it hard. It's made it really challenging. And so, you know, right now, um, because uh, counties don't have some of the uh, authority they need, and I can close the pools in Sioux Falls, but I can't do anything about T or Harvard or Brandon or Harrisburg. And so we don't have a universal strategy to some of these things, which is, it's been the hardest part of the response for sure. And I, I have a weekly call with my kind of MSA mayors here in Sioux Falls, where we try to stay on the same page because we're all responding to this individually as our own municipalities, but we kind of have to have some level of co in order to avoid in our community. 
Right. But you also realize in politics, it's like, listen, I can I can call out the legislators and I can show that I'm upset. Um, that really won't get me anywhere. It's done. The special session is over. It was one is veto day. There's no more days. So it doesn't do any good just to like go in your corner and pout about it. It's like, all right, let's move on. and Let's figure out how we do this. Yeah. And that was that was, you know, one thing that you know, as a legislator, I would learn, you know, we would have you know, 15, 20 votes a day. And, and, uh, you know, a colleague and I might vehemently disagree on, on an issue on one vote and then be allies on the next one. And, and, uh, so we understood the importance of not letting emotions or personalities overrule you know, that, that process. And I think that's key. Uh, now, so you just completed two years as mayor, you know, you indicated that, and I've seen that. And what do you think about civility in social media? Uh, do you think it's more negative, more pronounced? Uh, what's your reaction? Well, um, you know, before becoming mayor, I, you know, you mentioned this, I started and founded a company called Click Rain, which I started in 2008. And in 2008, it was the days of MySpace. That was the there's there something called Friendster and MySpace were the two big social media channels. Twitter was just started in 08. And I'm like, I think there's something to this social media thing. Mm -hmm. And my first project I did when I started my company is I built a MySpace page for Joel Dykstra, who was running for U.S. Senate against then incumbent Tim Johnson. I built the MySpace page. And that's kind of, that was my first really entry into politics was through MySpace and the U.S. Senate race. And so I, the next decade, I built a whole company around social media and helping politicians and helping businesses. And so I've seen all the good it can do. And it's a powerful tool. And to the same token, uh, I think Facebook has become one of the worst uh, we're on Facebook right now. We're live. It has become one of the worst vehicles and worst things to happen to civility in the history of our society. And it has created broken families, broken relationships, um, rifts that drive people beyond repair. It's created an army of experts, of CDC directors right now, of constitutional attorneys, of, uh, of armchair mayors. And there's a lot of power behind the keyboard. And um, I'm going to give you an example, civility. Before this, earlier today, I went and I met with a guy, a business owner in Sioux Falls, who during my mayoral campaign, uh, he created a meme that made fun of me about something. It was, it was pretty, pretty cold. Uh, and it got traction and it kind of went viral in Sioux Falls during the heat of the out to me uh, about a month and a half ago and he said you know i've seen you leave in our city and he said i don't know if you know that i was in that meme that went crazy on and uh he said i just want to apologize because you're a different sort of person than i gave Talk. an atheist uh, liberal democrat and i'm not and we had a great conversation um but had he not reached out to me and apologized quite honestly i've had a kind of a bone to pick with this guy for two years because of how he attacked and what he did to me online and that just happens all over don and it's uh it seems to be coming becoming worse and worse uh as we go and i'm not sure how we put that toothpaste back yeah you know um that's a that's a really good point. And, you know, I've always, uh, I've always talked about the billboard test. Um, you know, don't take any action that you would be embarrassed about if it was on a billboard. And, uh, and then with social media, like with comments, um, don't say anything in a comment that you wouldn't say to a person's face. Uh, and, uh, you know, my sense is generally that takes care of things. I mean, and I get that people sometimes are frustrated uh, and, and, and they 
type things in that probably they would regret later. Um, and, and that's a fine line too, as you know, with when we, we talk about freedom of speech, um, you know, offensive speech, <laughs> you know, uh, is, is, it's kind of protected. Uh, we don't like it, but, but you, you have to, you know, you have to be careful. And again, that comes down to personal responsibility too, doesn't it? Right. Um, right. And, and, or you'll, or there'll be a blog where you can be anonymous. And then of course, as you imagine, the gloves come off then. Yeah. yeah. And that's where, uh, Twitter quite honestly is a, is a worse platform than Facebook. Twitter, you can have anonymous handles. You don't have to put in real names. Um, you see some real nasty people and nasty stuff on Twitter. Uh, Facebook, you have to have a birth date to enter it in. You have to have a valid email address and all those things. Um, but you're right. There's there's freedom of speech, and that stuff's protected online and offline. Um, it's it crosses the line quite a bit though. In in that, um, you know, I had a guy when we were talking about do we need to do a stay at home order in Sioux Falls. You know, he reached out to me on Facebook and said he was going to use his his uh, Second Amendment rights on me and my family. That's what he said. And um, would he have said that to me to my face? I doubt it. And did he mean it? No. But because so I had to turn that over to the police department and say, I got a legitimate threat right here. Mm -hmm. So the police went and knocked on the guy's door and his eyes were big as saucers. He said, are what I, I didn't mean that. Well, you wrote that you were going to use your Second Amendment rights against the mayor and his family. So what do you think that means? So people just get so bold behind that keyboard and don't realize there's a person on the other end. There's consequences on the other end of that. Yeah, and, and again, you know, and that's the challenge here uh, is to appeal to our better nature, our, our, our better angels, and, and, uh, and just um you know it's okay to disagree you know we can all we can all handle that and we're not going to agree on everything uh you know certainly you and i have uh we we differ on some of these positions uh and and you know you and i each have people out there uh, uh you know in the community that uh, disagree with each of us um but uh i think it's important that people still have that discussion, be willing to have that discussion and be willing to face conflict in, in civil debate, in, in public right. discourse. I think that's very important. So talk to me about your, your interactions uh, with elected officials, Governor Nome and uh, Senators Rounds and Thune and, and you know, what's been, and your council members and uh, legislators, what's been the most effective technique for you? Well, you know, in working with elected officials, um, you have to realize that what may be a priority to you uh, is not a priority to them. And so if I have a big highway project or if I have uh, an out coronavirus outbreak in Sioux Falls and I'm pleading to the governor and we're talking and we're saying, listen, I got to realize she's got a whole state, okay? And not, Sioux Falls isn't the only thing she's worried about right now. And sometimes we forget that we get so focused on our lane we have to understand that and remember that, listen, they got a whole other set of fish to fry. So I try to use my powder, you know, I keep it pretty dry for things that I think only really matter and are important and things that um, they would care about. So um, with, with Senator Thune, for instance, very early on, I reached out to him specifically about Smithfield and the USDA and Department of Ag and make sure that what is gonna be the impact on the food chain if this, if this closes. Um, and what is Sonny Purdue saying about these closures and so forth? Because that is his lane. That's where I need his expertise. Am I going to tap into some of these people to ask him about pool closures or, you know, what we should do with some of these other things? No, and quite honestly, um, I, I shouldn't. And so realizing that we're stronger together uh, is, is always a good, uh, a good thing to remember and realizing that tension is healthy. Tension is fine. Tension is good. And tension is what leads to good outcomes because I have that with my city council. I have tension at times and uh, we're on different planets at times, but I have to remember in their heart, 
and in my heart, we're both trying to do the same thing. We're both trying to do what's best for our city. How we, how we get there uh, is where we always debate, where we disagree. But we both are elected to serve, hopefully for the right reasons. And if we are, then disagreements can be very healthy. Well, completely agree with you about that. Um, because, uh, you know, I think, I think it's important that, uh, uh, you know, that you continue to have that sort of discourse and, and not be afraid to, to not always agree. Um, you know, I, I held some training for capital leaders, uh, for, for uh, some state legislators, and I had leadership from both parties in this training. Uh, and because like you said, they all are in this uh, because they believe strongly in the state and they wanna make things better. And, and the key is, I think, is to always assume good faith. Correct. To always assume that they're acting in good faith. Don't assume the worst in these people. Uh, and and that's, that's, I think that's important. And well, let me, uh, let me tell you this. Last night, Don, uh, at this time, 24 hours ago, I was at a city council meeting. I don't know if you happen to see what happened in the Sioux Falls City Council last night. But at the end of the meeting, uh, a gentleman came up for public input and uh, screamed and yelled at me, um, went over his time limit to speak, wouldn't leave. Um, I had to call security. He screamed at me as he walked out. Called and said, hypocrite, hypocrite, hypocrite. He just walked out yelling that at me. And I was embarrassed for him. He, he looked like an absolute fool. So on my way home, trying not to let that fume and let that fester. And this is just me, but I go to my faith and I say, listen, that guy is a child of God created in God's image, just like I am. I am no better than he is. He is no better than I am. Do we... Is he that passionate because he loves the city? I hope so. I hope that's why he's that passionate. And so that gets me through a lot of these tensions too. When I realize, listen, we're all children of God. We're all put on this earth, earth to, to serve in the same way. Uh, we just do it a little bit different and that's okay. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, I think that's uh, important to have that a spiritual uh, you know, perspective. Um, because that's part of it too and and you know so you know advice advice for a an average citizen if they want to make a difference um what would you tell uh somebody let's say uh you know somebody has an issue with uh, the way the city is enforcing a, a, an ordinance or someone maybe thinks we ought to change a law in in pure what advice would you have for the person that's never done any of that before? You know, um, I'll tell you what people think they need to do. And a lot of times they think they need to go to a city council meeting and speak at public input. And I'll tell you, it's, it's probably fourth or fifth on the efficacy list, in my opinion. Um, what I have done is I have open office hours, for instance, first Friday of every month where people can come and meet with me one-on-one -on -one. and you don't have to get up front of a podium, be all nervous, come to a city council meeting, come meet with, that's the great thing about local government. You still can get access one-on-one -on -one time with the mayor of your city. You know, good luck getting out with federal officials, you know, when you want it, you usually get a constituent representative or something. So that's, that's one, but two then, if your voice is not being heard from the city, you have to work with your, your local representative, whether that's a city councilor, or take, them, take the issue to them, take the message to them. Um, and then third, if that's not working um, and your elected officials aren't getting back to you, then it certainly doesn't hurt to make some noise, right? Make some noise, start writing some letters, get some people together. Um, if they hear from you one time, it's maybe nothing. If they hear from you twice, okay, maybe there's something here. Once you hear on the same issue three or four times, you're like, all right, there's something here now. I've, there's been enough noise made on this to me that I need to act on it and I need to listen more. Yeah, um, completely agree. And there were, um, you know, as a legislator, I would, I would get lobbyists, of course, would, have, would approach me and, they, you know, and they, they serve a very good function. 
but when I would get a uh, just a, a random citizen or a, a constituent that would say, "Hey, uh, you know, Don, I, I've got this issue," uh, that gets my attention, and um, and I know that that's the case for for uh, other legislators, you know, in South Dakota, and and you know, we're really blessed to have very close contact uh, and access to our elected officials, both at the local level as well as the state level uh, it, uh, we mm -hmm. have the kind of access that is unheard of in a in a minnesota or a or a pennsylvania or a michigan where you you're going through layer after layer of staff people and you never really know if, if the elected official ever heard your message uh and but but you're right you know right. you start, you start uh, at at the lowest level and and maybe that's even a department head before you ever or a or a a, you know, a, a, an agency uh, person before you ever go to an elected official. But, but the bottom line is citizens can make a difference. And, uh, and they just, you know, they, we all work for them. Elected officials work for citizens. And I think it's important to remember that. Yeah. And I tell you what, what's effective for citizens is it's one thing to say, mayor, the pool should be open, quit being a dictator. It's the worst decision ever. That's going to go in one ear and out the other. But if someone says, Mayor, my five-year-old son is autistic, and the only thing that gets him to calm down is swimming pools. And taking the swimming pools away is going to be you know, blah, blah, blah. Personalize it. So obviously, you have a reason for wanting pools. Tell me a story. I mean, you have to. Elected officials are people, too. We want to know why these issues are so meaningful to people instead of going right to the name calling and right to the, you know, the you're the worst mayor ever, you're drunk with power. It's like, no, but tell me why this issue is so passionate to you and help me understand so I can better serve you and better get to a solution that we can maybe all agree on. Yes, uh, agreed. So um, have we become too dependent on government to solve societal problems. Uh, you know, it seems that whenever we, you know, we have problems, that's the first place we run is to government. And do you, do you think that's the proper role? Are we, are we neglecting the power of other institutions like education and like, like uh, business leaders in the community? Mm -hmm. um, visit about that a little bit. Well, shortly after I took office, I created this this framework and this model we call One Sioux Falls. And and I use it as kind of this mantra and this rallying cry in the community and we have lapel pins. And, and the reason I came up with that and use that is because early on I could tell everyone was coming to me with their problem. Hey, Mayor, here's my problem. Mayor, why is there trash at the corner of uh, 14th and, and Grange here? And I'm like, well, if you walk past the trash and saw it, what, what am I? Pick it up. Like, this is our city. This is one super. We all have to solve these things together. This isn't a Paul problem. This is an all of us problem. And so getting people, yeah, to rely less on, hey, create a government program to fix this. And instead saying, no, we don't need a government program. We need a community program, a business leader program, you know, different people that can help solve these problems. Um, you know, the pandemic has kind of highlighted that too with, um, you know, the, the Hong Kong flu of 1968-69. And I don't know if you know a lot about that, but 100,000 Americans died, a million people worldwide, the government did nothing. We held Woodstock at the, at the peak of the Hong Kong flu in the late 60s. Fast forward 50 years, we got a similar pandemic and it's government, please tell us what to do. Shut us down. Shut down my barbershop. Tell me if I can go get a haircut. And it's, uh, it's been weird. It's just a weird shift where people look to government to solve the problem. And we play a role, but the community plays as big of a role, if not a bigger part. Yeah, and let me refresh uh, your memory and people's memories when the tornado came through. Uh, what really happened after the tornado came through. You had uh, 
volunteers left and right in the hundreds stepping up and, and helping their neighbors, uh, you know, cleaning up debris and uh, securing, you know, belongings in a house that wasn't able to be occupied. And, and that was a really rewarding experience for them. And I think it opened the eyes of a lot of people to what the community can bring to the table when it comes to solving society's problems. And I think that parallels with what's happening today. Yeah, because yeah, the tornado's a great example because we, we talked about this and we said, listen, we have two options. There are trees everywhere in our city. We can come out at a press conference and we can say, that we're gonna come through, we're gonna clean out our city, we're gonna take control. Or we can say, listen, we're not gonna be able to get to all these places very quickly. There's a lot of damage. Step up, get your chainsaws out, start helping your neighbor, start hauling. And we didn't have hundreds, we had thousands of volunteers and we had this town cleaned up in less than 10 days. And it was incredible. And the cost of the taxpayer was this, the self gratification that people got from helping their neighbor went through the roof and their sense of community went through the roof as a result. So it was really a win-win all around how the community stepped up there. Yeah, I, I think so, um, I do. So you mentioned this at the beginning and, and I, I'm gonna raise this uh, point again um, here near the end. Um, so you led Sioux Falls through times of severe flooding, uh, through tornadoes, and now this pandemic. And of course, that makes me wonder, well, what if something really difficult comes along? But, but uh, like murder hornet, we, okay, we won't go there. But my, right? my, my question really is, so again, what lessons uh, for, for our community are to be gained from all that? Well, I can speak specifically about, you know, the Sioux Falls community and people in Sioux Falls. They have to know they live in one of the best cities in the world and the resiliency and sense of community here is incredible. And um, they need to take heart in that. They need to know they live in a good city. And if you complain about your city and you think uh, we're doing some things wrong, I'm sure we are. but go live in go live in Detroit or live in Nashville or go live in, you know, Laredo or El Paso. Sioux Falls is pretty great. It's a pretty great place. The other thing that people need to know about this community, and I think most communities um, can say this same thing, but I really see in Sioux Falls is there are some incredible leaders in our city government. And so the mayor gets, you know, the blame and the praise a lot for whatever happens, but just an army of strong public servants that are making the right decisions for the city. City attorneys uh, that are saying, hey, you know, they're keeping us in the right lane on the legal decisions we're making through COVID to our public health team that's advising me on every decision we're making to our housing team that's keeping people housed during this time through helping set up this one Sioux Falls fund that's helped, you know, pay for people's rent if they can't afford it from COVID. Um, incredible team of city leaders. And that's important for citizens to know because if something bad comes our way, we got it. We got good people. We got a good community. And if the past two years haven't shown you that, um, we, we can recover from almost anything. You know, it, yeah, I completely agree uh, you know, with that as well. And, and again, and you've heard me talk about the different institutions, you know, uh, you know, we've got the, you know, uh, we've got the government institution, which is always that, that kind of that, uh, first resort out of habit, but we have, we have, uh, the, you know, the community, we've got, we've got the, uh, the business institution, we've got the education institution, all of them stepped up throughout all this, but, uh, you know, all too often, uh, you know, as leaders, I think, you know, well, why didn't you count them among our assets? Uh, and, and I think that's the, you know, that's the key is that we should look at all those different assets when we, uh, you know, when we look to solve society problems, because those having everybody involved in those, those uh, in the discussions and the resolutions of, of problems usually leads to better solutions. So one of the best success stories from the pandemic here has been three days after we had our first case in Sioux Falls, a bunch of churches got together 
they started something called Corona Help SF. And they said, listen, we're going to have to start delivering food and goods to people who are shut in, who don't want to go out, who, you know, have, have lost some of their benefits as a result of this. And our church community united like that fast. So much so that other municipalities, Boca Raton, the mayor, I know the mayor, Mayor Singer, Boca Raton, he reached out and said, can you send me the documentation of what you guys did there? Because we want to like copy and paste that in Boca Raton. I don't know how you did that. I said, I didn't do it at all. Our church community did that. So the government, we didn't even have to do that. So there's just kind of some great success stories that we take for granted that that's um, just what happens in Sioux Falls. It's very rare. A lot of cities would love to have that sort of you know, boots on the ground collaboration that happens. Well, listen, uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your evening uh, to uh, spend it with uh, some of my friends and, and uh, um, it's, it's been a good discussion. Uh, and Amen. You're, you're welcome anytime, but uh, thanks for uh, hanging out with us tonight. I think we'll, uh, we'll give people uh, a couple of minutes of their, uh, their evening back. Sounds good. Well, thanks for having me, Don. Thanks for what you guys do. And uh, we'll do it again sometime, hopefully in person. So you bet very well. Yes. Yeah. Looking forward to that. I'll come down and see you when it's, when it's okay to do. Yes. Amen. All right. All right, sir. Have a good evening. You too. Thanks Get again. Bye-bye. Yep.